I can go anytime. Have, All right. Yeah, either I'll of us. Okay. Let me bring these guys up. Uh, this is uh, a case that I shared with some folks earlier in the week, and it's kind of interesting and a bit weird too. So this is an incidental finding. I'm trying to remember why the CT was obtained, but it had nothing to do with this finding. So here it is down here in the lower mediastinum. Here is this strange structure that contains some calcium, and it is adjacent to esophagus, aorta. And then when we go to the lung window and scroll along, you can see that it goes into lung and it actually branches. Here's one little branch of it in that direction. There's another little branch in that direction. So it clearly is a tubular structure, but it's not a pacified with contrast medium. It's certainly consistent with a thrombosed vessel with calcifications in the wall as well. So I looked to see if I could find any potential attachment to the aorta, but I really can't. It's right between esophagus and aorta, and I looked and I looked, but I couldn't find a point of potential attachment. Perhaps it was at some point. Um, of course, we'll never be able to really determine that, but it's certainly consistent with a thrombosed vessel, uh, presumably a systemic artery that is supplying that portion of lung. And then here's a really nice observation that Leif made, which is uh, when I showed it to him, and it's kind of cute. So he said, well, there's one bronchus, I'm trying to find that bronchus here, that um, doesn't seem to have a companion artery. So for example, right there, we followed that bronchus. It doesn't seem to have a companion artery at all. So. Uh, we're just going to call that the lonely bronchus sign. So I don't know if there's any connection between the absent pulmonary artery branch, at least focally here, and the presence of a focal systemic arterial supply. But let me just remind myself if that's the artery. Yep, that it is. So just a curious case of a thrombosed, presumably systemic artery. Didn't see any other findings. And then that, that curious bronchus there. So beyond that, don't know what to make of this case, but clearly just an incidental congenital thing. Oh, as, um, as Jeff pointed out, there aren't any ancillary findings to suggest the sequestration as such, so there's no focal bronchial atresia or parenchymal abnormality associated with it to suggest this is a variant of sequestration per se. Okay, this is an interesting case that I saw after an open lung biopsy had been performed. And I wish this kind of case had been maybe discussed before that biopsy was performed. So here's a chest radiograph, just to give you a flavor of what the lungs look like. Um, there are clearly cystic spaces in the apical lungs. There are these relatively coarse reticular opacities in the upper lung zones and similar defined opacities, hard to describe in the lower lung zones. So let me bring up the thin cuts for you. Well, actually, this is from the outside, so I don't have super thin cuts, but this will suffice. So as we scroll down here, we see some really bizarre subpleural cystic spaces. They're clearly embedded in very abnormal lung. In the interior of the lung here, we don't see nice typical areas of central lobular emphysema, but very extensive cystic spaces but clearly very abnormal parenchyma surrounding those cystic spaces in the upper lung zones. And then the remarkable finding in the lower lung zones are findings super typical for basal lung DIP in the sense that we have extensive ground glass opacity. There are a couple of small cystic spaces within that region. So I think the findings are very consistent with smoker's lung. I don't think any other diagnosis needs to be invoked for that. Um, let me just show you this one article that I have among others that describe the presence of thin walled cystic spaces um, in smokers. So for example, this one was titled multiple thin walled cysts 
uh, with fibrosis. And they show these bizarre cystic spaces. Of course, some of these are not so much subpleural, but they can also be more internal to the lung. But I like to think perhaps some of the cystic spaces that this patient has is this form of cystic space, cystic spaces and aerospace enlargement associated with smoking. So that's just one article. And to no one's surprise, the biopsy report will show just a really classic and nice teaching case of smoking related disease with all the findings you can want to see. So um, massive accumulation of pigmented smokers, macrophages, the cystic spaces, um, line by respiratory epithelium, corresponding with the cysts identified on imaging, and so on and so forth. So a really nice case of smoker's lung, pretty severe. Yeah. But any of you guys have any, any hesitation in simply describing this as smoker's lung with confidence, not really needing a biopsy, I think? I agree with no, you. I agree with you. Especially in the absence of a connective tissue disease. Yeah. Yeah. Howard, I think the other point, those larger, the air, uh, bizarre cystic spaces in the upper lobes, that sometimes we've seen smoking related fibrosis with those types of things in the lower lobes. And a lot of times people will want to call it honeycombing, but as you can see, they're much larger and, and, and yeah. irregular and just, you know, it's, weird shaped. Yeah, we, very much so. We, we should say that this is very much so. edema, partly in the apices, right? Sorry, I think I'm hearing someone make a comment. That was, that was David. I, I don't think we could hear you very well, David. So uh, how about periceptal emphysema as a description for some of that upper lobe uh, peripheral stuff? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, now yeah. I can. I think that these cystic spaces are so large, so irregularly shaped, clearly embedded in presumably the fibrotic lung. Okay. Not, they're much larger than the usual cystic spaces. We just look at it and say, oh, yeah. Central oh, yeah. I think it's hard to differentiate it from paraseptal emphysema. The biopsy report, though, did comment oh, on sorry, yeah. the cysts in the upper lobes as well. And how about uh, how about in the bases? Was there any biopsy of the bases to see whether that was DIP or anything like that for the ground glassy stuff? Yeah, if you see over here, they did biopsies in several places. And one of the first statements was smokers and pages around China airways. I think the pathologists are getting away from, you know, sort of these individual smoking related patterns and sort of like, like in this case, they kind of describe it and then lump it together as smoking diffuse, you know, parenchymal lung diseases. And I started doing the same thing in my clinical practice. It is like as Howard said, you know, a fancy way of saying smoker's lung. And then, you know, in this case, it's clearly it's, it's got the cystic spaces and the ground glass predominant. Some of them have more RB look. Some even have longer Han cell appearance. Um, and also the comment on the emphysema, interesting in this case, Howard, there's not a lot of central lobular emphysema, which makes you think that a lot of that peripheral, and so not all that peripheral stuff is exquisitely subplural. Um, That's right. and, that is, and there are they, some of that, they are too big, but there probably is a little bit tucked in there. Um, but it's striking how little emphysema you see in the central lobular cores. That's right. Yeah. Very interesting. Huh? All right, let me show you this case next. So this, starting off with the radiograph, is a great teaching example of the so-called hilum overlay sign. So we see this large opacity, yet we see the vascular right pulmonary artery and the descending pulmonary artery very nicely. And here is the lateral that goes along with that. And we see its anterior and location. I think you can also add the right paratracheal stripe into that too, that you still see it as well. So as another the right tracheal another, stripe like, very normal, so it's not yeah. paratracheal in location because we see it very nicely. Good, yeah. Yep. Great. So let me show you the appearance on the CT first. So large mass. I was struck by the amount of internal necrosis in the mass. And then looking for additional lymph node enlargement, yes, there is some. 
but not very much in the right paratracheal region. Um, when I saw this, I'm probably affected by the fact that in the last couple of months, we've seen cases of so-called nut midline carcinoma. This is a young person. So I looked for nodal disease or nodal metastases outside of the chest in the supraclavicular regions, and there isn't any. And for some reason, I got fixated in that as a possibility. It doesn't really wrap around vessels in the parahyla region, like the cases we've shown before. But I suggested to the pathologist they should at least think about that. And this is not that. This is a lymphoma. And I guess nothing that unusual about it. So it's a mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. There you can see the straightforward description of it in the pathology report. And this will give you a feel for what it looks like on PET, which was done subsequently after the biopsy. So much rather have this than the nut midline carcinoma for sure. And these nodes are positive, as you can see, with a lot of necrosis. All right. Here is a case of, let me see. Okay, this one is by chance a case that I saw the other day, which complements the one I showed about two weeks ago very nicely. So it's a pattern of fibrosis, which is really inconsistent with a UIP, IPF diagnosis. So let me just bring up representative examples from 2015. And I'm going to look for the thin cuts if we have any from more recently. Just a second. These are a bit mixed up. So 2015 there. And let me put this one alongside. And I'm going to separate those. So put these side by side. So here we are. The timing again here is a couple years between these two. So this person is known to have interstitial fibrosis. And then let's look at this one first and, and get a feel for the pattern of fibrosis. So there's a lot of reticulation, very diffuse bilateral. There's an area here which has a lot of opacity, focally in the peripheral right up lobe within which we see some traction bronchiectasis and then we see other areas like it to a slightly less extent in the lingular division with foci of traction bronchiectasis within but relatively sparing of the subpleural portions of the lower lung zones and this is just going to show the same findings except the fibrosis has worsened substantially since 2015 but this large focal area up here and what's key for this case is what I got subsequently in our ILD conference, which um, I didn't know, was that this patient has a strong family history. So both mother and two siblings have pulmonary fibrosis. So undoubtedly a case of familial pulmonary fibrosis. I think we would all probably suggest, particularly if we saw a lot more of this, we'd wonder whether the pathology is pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis, but otherwise certainly a pattern one can see with familial pulmonary fibrosis. And this is very similar to a case I showed about two, two, three weeks ago. All right, those are my cases, Jeff. All right, thank you, Howard. All right, who would like to show their cases next? I can go. All right, Travis. It's been an interesting week. Let's, we're going to start with this one. This is a guy that had a redo bilateral lung transplant. He's 45, and his lung transplant was on the second. This is his initial post-operative radiograph, and you can see bilateral chest tubes and you know typical early post-transplant stuff in the lungs. And his, the fact that it was the redo transplant is kind of important and will come into play. Few days later, stuff on you know stuff is clearing some, certainly clearing more on the right than the left, and we can see even a few days. This is a week out. There's still some stuff on the left, and of course, you know we don't really have the history at this point. Don't know if this guy's got some sort of superimposed pneumonia, if it's just some atelectasis, or if he's aspirating. Uh, but he was having some hemoptysis, and 
didn't get better. And in fact, here is a few days later, he was decompensating a little and now he's got effusions and some stuff recurring on the right. But this left side has, you know, has kind of stayed like this. And the fact that he had hemoptysis prompted them to do contrast on this study. And yeah, Jeff, this is crazy that this is a week after you showed a case, you know, last week, look at the lung here and look at the left inferior or the left lower lobe. And you see that confined to the left lower lobe, there's some, you know, the, the airways are very thick. There's some thickening of the, the fissures there. There's a the septal thickening. It just looks congested and there's a lot of ground glass and a little bit of consolidation. And so as, as Jeff showed the case last week of the ligated pulmonary vein, always you know, look at the veins as a potential source of edema slash hemorrhage slash congestion or even necrosis of the lung. And in this case, we can see that there's a left superior pulmonary vein, but there's no left inferior pulmonary vein. It just abruptly cuts off right here. Now, reading the operative report, the surgeon had said that because of the, the fact that it was a redo transplant, there were a lot of adhesions. And instead of being able to do one reanastomosis on the left on, on the left of the pulmonary vein as they would prefer to do, they had to do separate anastomoses of both the left superior pulmonary vein and the left inferior pulmonary vein. And I think you can even see a little bit of the a tail of the thrombus here that they found at surgery. So this was completely thrombosed. There was a lot of fibrosis and, and inflammation, well, more inflammation in this area. And they were already trying to develop some neovascularity into that left lower lobe, as you can see on the operative report, but they ended up doing a left lower lobectomy. And this, I, I included this, just the description uh, that they found some thrombus in that left inferior pulmonary vein as the culprit for this. So not ligated, but this, the same effect fact so hmm. yeah so it's two of the two pulmonary vein occlusions in two weeks here between between us so these things are coming in waves here's one that I haven't seen in a while and i'm going to actually start at the end this was i think monday morning i walked into the reading room and and the surgeon walked in about the same time this patient had been transferred over the weekend and we've now seen several cases of this. This was a patient that had had, had AFib ablation done elsewhere, transferred to UCSF. And of course, the suspicion was for atrioesophageal fistula. This study was done elsewhere before they were transferred. And we can see the telltale sign that we often see, which is a tiny focus of gas and maybe a little fleck of something in the left atrium right next to one of the pulmonary vein ostea where they did the ablation. And so, you know, the, of course, as I think, Howard, you're the only one that's actually shown a case where we saw air in the atrium. But usually by the time it gets to the atrium, it has embolized somewhere else. It just floats away. So, yeah, you know, having seen several of these now that I've shown and others have shown, told the surgeon that definitely this is, you know, what we expect to see with an AFib, or with an atrioesophageal fistula. So the esophagus is over here. And it's interesting on this outside study, I'm not sure since it wasn't there, but they did a whole host of different series with this. They even did one with oral contrast. You can see the esophagus and the, the, this air outside of the esophagus. Mm. And so I think they had a suspicion and they transferred the patient. Now, I wanted to show it last here and kind of work backwards because I think it's an interesting presentation. And it's one that, you know, I saw similar findings on one of the cases that I had for memory. So usually these fistulae occur in the two to four week period. She was exactly one month out, so like 31 or 32 days. And she had had an abdomen and pelvis CT when she came in on the 7th because she came in with fever, chills, other symptoms, and they thought maybe she had pyelonephritis. She had had prior, uh, she'd had prior urinary tract infections. And you can see even here, there's a little bit of inflammation near that pulmonary vein. This is, you know, the esophagus is right here, but you wonder if there's like the tiniest little abscess or something that's developing under there. And I know at least one of the cases I showed, there was mediastinitis a week before the patient developed the fistula. Then they, um, I'll pull up the report now and just show you. And and this is one of those ones, you know, the, where she ended up going undergoing echo. And of course, if this is suspected, you really don't want to do an EGD or a TEE because you risk causing massive air embolization when you insufflate the esophagus. 
Uh, she had already had a few strokes at this point, but they did take her to surgery at UCSF and, and the surgeon showed me the photos. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to get them from him yet to include them, but there was a small little hole in the pericardium. There was a lot of adhesions. And so they did a muscle flap repair. Now, unfortunately, she has a bunch of, she's had a bunch of strokes and never had any air emboli. But you can see she's got several areas of edema, right parietal most, and frontal and parietal mostly, and some on the other side as well. Um, now, the other thing I'll just show you quickly is has really nothing to do with that, but check out her lungs. And she, as a bonus, she also has a bunch of cysts in her lungs and they look pretty smooth and uniform. It's a woman. And I think on this abdomen and pelvis CT that she's probably got at least one AML here. So I think she probably has tuberous sclerosis as well. Um, but that, that's, of course, you know, the least of her issues right now. So this is the this is the sixth AFib or atriosophageal fistula in my collection. I know, Howard, you have it, what, at least two or three others? Yeah, several. Yeah. So, so Travis, were all of her strokes after her ablation surgery or had she had strokes before? No, these were all acute strokes from the, from the surgery. Yeah, they, they were all within the past, you know, within the, after her presentation. She came in first septic. Then it wasn't until the second or third day of her hospitalization when she developed hemiparesis. So this was her first head CT on this eighth. And you can see there's really not much at this point, maybe a little bit in her, you know, a little bit of edema maybe in her frontal lobe on the right. Uh, but they were all a consequence. And, and she never had air emboli, any macroscopic air emboli. And I will say the other thing is that, you know, several of her blood cultures continued to grow a bunch of different you know, oral and, and GI uh, flora as well. Mm. Yeah, and so they repaired her. Unfortunately, she doesn't have the best prognosis as these patients usually don't, um, but they did go in and repair it and she hasn't had any strokes since then. I'll show two quick radiograph cases uh, that have also come in in succession. The, the CT, one of my colleagues read this one and, and you know, astutely noted that this is a 61-year-old patient that there's some deviation of the trachea here. This was a VA patient, and there's a no funky contour to the aorta. And you can see it has this, it's hard to know if it's the aorta itself, if there's a little mass or nodule up here. And so they you know, thought maybe there's an aneurysm, maybe there's some mass next to the, the aorta. And they underwent a CT a couple days ago. And you can see that it, it, in fact, is is a very mild coarctation, which is kind of interesting. And it's a, a weird look. I'll put it in 3D here, because that whole con, that whole opacity is it corresponds to the aorta. But you can see on the lateral that it, you know, never really gets narrowed that much, and they certainly don't have any you know, intercostals or or internal mammaries. So it's almost more of a pseudo coarctation, but it doesn't really buckle that much. And it's also interesting that the the origin or the proximal left subclavian is a little dilated as well. So I don't know if this is, oh, this go ahead, David. Pseudocoart. It, the one thing is that the arch itself is quite high. It's way above the pulmonary artery. So it's the post buckle part that is in the normal location of the um, left aortic arch. So when you get this high arch, it's really pseudocoart. So this it, it's a modest deformity, but it's good enough. I've got one, actually I saw a case today, that he's even a subtler deformity than this, but it has the high arch. So I think it's a, a form frust of uh, pseudocort. So yeah. the high and, position of the arch is, is a giveaway. Now, was there a bicuspid valve in this person? There was a bicuspid valve, and that was, the, yeah, that was the next thing I was gonna say. It does look like the patient had a bicuspid valve, it's calcified. Uh, and I think they've since confirmed that with echo. Um, yeah, which of course can be associated with the coarct or pseudo coarct. Right, 50%. So. That's really interesting. Can you, Travis, yeah. show the PA and maybe make us a coronal NPR side by side so we can see? What the A order, so part of it is the A order, it's the elongated A order. I'll try and I was going to try and do the the uh, ray sum image. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah. 
So, so this is here. the higher portion. That's right. So that's the actual arch. The actual arch is higher than uh, the post buckle part, which is in the location yeah. of the normal arch. And I think this is the subclay that proximal dilated left subclavian right here, which corresponds to that. And no notching. And no notching, yeah. So. Yeah, it makes an interesting impression on that trick. Yeah, it's sort of focal. Yeah, it does. A little odd. A little odd. Yeah, yeah, and then you can account for the whole thing right here on the lateral too. You can see the 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 pseudo coarct right there. And you can think so. you can Ascending aortic enlargement here too. Um, Probably the related to the bicuspid valve, yeah, like a bicuspid aortopathy. Let's see. Yeah, it's not that big, but she, it's a female, and yeah, yeah, so maybe indexed for her size, it's big, but or at least upper limits of normal. Yeah, so that was that was the pseudo coarct, and then I just got this from my one of my residents this morning. He was on call a couple nights ago, and this was at the general. And the patient came in with chest pain. He saw these, looks like old heel root fracture deformity and commented on the presence of an enlarged aorta. This is a 34 year old. He actually looks a lot older than 34, just based on the radiograph, but I think it's probably the old trauma. Um, and also has this deviation of the trachea. And of course, there was some suspicion, maybe he had a dissection or you know, some sort of aortic, acute aortic syndrome that could account for symptoms. Uh, and, but, and I'll go back to the radiograph, but then on his CT, you can see in this case that this is actually the coarct and that there's, you know, a substantial narrowing here. And in his case, he does have significant amount of, of collateral vessel formation, inter including the intercostals and the internal mammary arteries. And so when you go back to his radiograph, you can, in fact, see that he does have some rib notching, I think, you know subtle but i think there is a little bit there but so this was an actual coarct and it's interesting that how how dilated his descending aorta is now the one, the one thing and I, I haven't gotten feedback or follow up on this yet because i asked i asked my resident what the heck's going on with his skin yeah he's got a he's got a bunch of these little look like almost skin nodules and you know there are rare cases of, of neurofibromatosis associated with with uh coarctation and I don't know if it's that they're actually associated with of course you can have the mid aortic syndrome with neurofibromatosis or if they're just true true and unrelated but I haven't gotten any follow up on the weird skin stuff he's got going on here well mm. but, so, how far how far down does that aortic dilation go in the descending aorta is it does it goes way far down yeah, even right, even at the you know in the distal descending, it's almost three centimeters, which certainly larger than we expect. Yeah, it's a bizarre one. Because I even thought when I saw the rib fractures here that maybe this was going to be a a weird. You know, when he showed it to me, that it might be a weird post traumatic pseudo aneurysm like we sometimes see. And granted, it doesn't have that typical look, but are are there um, skin leaks associated with Louis Dietz syndrome? I'm trying to remember whether there are skin problems with that. It has. I don't know. Um, I I I wouldn't. I think this descending order is too big for cohort. There's got to be something else going on, some collagen problem here. Yeah, would, some some sort of underlying el elastopathy or something. Right. I think this guy needs a workup and uh, skin lesions yeah, well, too. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a hemodynamically significant stenosis as well. So it, it's not the typical, I agree, it's not the typical coarct. This is a form of, you know, it's a, by definition, I think, a form of a coarct just because he has, you know, enough narrowing there to cause hemodynamic compromise. But yeah, I agree. I, I don't think the full story is known. And that's why I was looking and noticed those skin lesions and wondered if this was some sort of, you know, some sort of genetic thing. He also has a dilated aorta there. I mean, dilated esophagus. So he's a, he looks like a tall guy here. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think, yeah. I think we should call this Travis complex or Travis syndrome. <laughs> there's, there's something congenital here. Yeah. yeah. We don't know what it is. So. Yeah. I, I agree. I'm glad you, yeah, but you're, you're suspicious too of something yeah. else.
All right. Uh, Jeff, I, I'll stop for there. I've, I've got a couple more, but I'll let you guys go and then. Okay. And wreck around at the end. David, do you want to showcase this next? I uh, I was I didn't have time to get anything together, so that's I wanted to show, I wanted to show that aorta case that I asked you about, the one that you sent years ago, seven years ago, but I couldn't. I'm trying to find it here. I don't have it on my main computer. I do do it on my laptop. I'll mobilize it for next time. Okay. Well, I've got a, a, a an aorta sh uh, showcase for today too. Funny where this is the topic today. Um, let me. Let's see here. Show my screen. All right, cool. So you should, yeah, there we go. So this here is on a theme. But before I start the order, let me show you this case because this is kind of a, a fun case that we did um, earlier. This is a baby that was born with a tracheoesophageal fistula, and they wanted they being the thoracic surgery pediatric people wanted to uh, get a good look at his airway because they were pretty convinced he had you know, collapse and what was the full extent of the malacia or the collapse. And so we tried something on one of our new scanners um, that has a longer Z axis uh, to um, range and a very, you know, it's a, it's a newer scanner. I, I forget how many slices it is, but it's one of those three digit slices. Um, and so what we did is we did a cine airway and this has been described in the, actually we found a fairly older article, um, on a different manufacturer's, uh, 320. But what we did is we, um, did this without any anesthesia, just free breathing. And you can see the dilated esophagus with the fluid level in it. And as we come into the thorax, we see that there's collapse anteriorly. So there's clearly malacia and you can see how severe this is. Um, and it goes where the crossing vessels are. You can see the CT, right? Yes. Okay, good. And so, but what we did is because of the, the way this, we were able to do this all in one rotation, we were able to do this over multiple, uh, it's kind of like a gated cardiac. We just did it during free breathing. And uh, what uh, one of my colleagues uh, made some interesting little cine loops of this. I can get to play here. Yeah, you can see, you can see this kind of fixed defect. Sorry if it's making you dizzy. I'll stop it. But you can see that during breathing, this is a pretty fixed defect there because of the passing vessel. And there's the dilated esophagus. We also have it in, um, in cross section as well, but you can see this dynamic technique. So this is from a technical standpoint, I did this. I think the DLP was about 30 something, maybe 40 at most. So you can do this with extremely low dose. And uh, my colleague, Chris Francois made some of these beautiful 3Ds. You can see that there's the dilated esophagus and then you've got the, the fixed narrowing here. And then I have, um, we, did, we did virtual bronch and all this, but th this is the actual optical bronchoscopy. And you can see there's that narrowing, <coughs> excuse me, in there. These, some of these aren't great, but there you go. You can see just how narrow this is anteriorly. So Malaysia, so they can do these uh, aorta pexies um, or they can sort of anchor the wall, support the, uh, the airway. So they're excited. The surgeons are excited because apparently they have some more patients they want to do this technique on. So I'm just going <clears> to <throat> work with our physicists to uh, see how we could do this in adults, given that we need to, uh, what kind of z-axis coverage we could do, maybe in two two acquisitions or something. But um, an interesting technique, as opposed to the the end end expiratory or the even the um, force dynamic. And I know Travis, you guys at UCSF do the cine expiratory or the at least the three. Slight, was it the three time points on your uh, your? Uh, yeah, we right. We do dynamic expiratory at three different levels. Yeah. So this is just more of a volumetric version of this, and you can do it during free breathing without needing sedation, or you just swaddle the baby, and you don't need um, general anesthesia. Okay, so let's let's look at some aortas here. So this is a twenty three day old um, that was born abnormal, and I'll start with the radiograph. And you can see a couple things. It's a premature child. We don't see the humeral heads. Um, the NG tube is in place. The lungs, a um, little granular, maybe a little bit of edema, but um, not horrible looking. But you will notice we don't see a big thymic contour that we typically see. And there's sort of this high opacity in the area of the aorta. It looks like there's normal situs in the abdomen. And so this is, um, these are some MR images. So this is just a a volumetric scan, let's make it the window, right? And this probably shows it best. This was done as non-contrast. 
Um, but a couple of things to point out. I thought I had more of the MR images, but there's no thymic tissue in here, which goes along with what I'm going to show. And um, well, I thought I had them. Did I lose them? I must have lost them. Anyway, um, I was going to show a. Uh, how did that happen? That is a bummer. Um, I had. Uh, here we go. I think. Um, no. I was going to show that this is a uh, another cervical arch. Well, you can you can sort of make out the vessels. Here's the arch up in here. There's the descending aorta, ascending aorta. Um, but I'll, I'll try to pull it up for next week. But it's just a nice companion to the previous week where we had a cervical aortic arch. This one tends to descend in the midline, so probably not circumflex. But it's also associated with DeGeorge syndrome, hence the thymic hyperplasia. All right, um, so I don't know where those images went. So this is another baby, a six day old, that was born with a hypoplastic left heart. And you can see the very small left ventricle or non-existent and this really hypertrophied right ventricle. And we see a very dilated uh, pulmonary artery and a large patent ductus that communicates with the descending aorta. But you'll notice the ascending aorta, there's the coronaries, here's the aortic root. We followed up, it's a hypoplastic aorta. It is a left aortic arch, but it's a very small aorta. Uh, gives rise to the right brachiosphalic, left common carotid. The left subclavian seems to come off right just distal to the ductus, uh, right in here. So as you can see, there's the distal arch. So, and then this is the left subclavian. So this is um, a left, so my theory is, and I probably pretty straightforward is because the there's no out there's really just other than through the PDA there's really no left ventricular outflow that the aorta doesn't develop normally uh, the embryologic tissues are there but it doesn't get big enough and all the blood's preferably going here so you end up with this hypoplastic aorta and in in, in, in some of the older literature it's referred to as coarctation but it really coarctation should be limited to that focal narrowing in the region of the ductus or the ligamentum in an older patient all right, uh, here's another congenital aorta. This is an eight day old uh, who had some uh, airway and esophageal issues. And so we see all the juicy thymic tissue in here and we can see a right aortic arch descends on the right. There is what looks like a diverticulum coming off of it. And these were called type two aortic or right aortic arches. And we see what looks like mirror image branching. Um, but because of the narrowing here, in this diverticulum, this is more consistent with a double aortic arch and with an atritic segment right in this region here, which was causing a complete vascular ring. Because a right aortic arch with a left ligament or ductus is a ring, but it's a very loose ring, as David has told us in the past, and uh, would not expect in most patients to cause symptoms. And we see this descends on the right. In my experience, the double aortic arch um, uh, is like in this case becomes more midline, but um, in children, their descending ears are often more midline anyway. But you can see it comes off the side and not really the top. And that's one of the things I find helpful in making this distinction because that's really the rudimentary or the remnant left aortic arch. And these typically occur in isolation because it's a double aortic arch, which is not associated with congenital heart disease. All right. And then here's a companion perfect case for you. Uh, Travis and David for our recent discussion. Whoops. So this was a radiograph done for, um, I can't remember, an unrelated reason, cough or something. Um, and we see a sort of a high aortic arch with a little funny bump in it. No rib notching. If we look on the lateral view, and I'll blow that up, you see it's sort of a high riding aortic arch. And there seems to be sort of a, a kink right in the region of the hilum or the hilar structures, the projection of those. And then it descends back down again. So, I mean, to me on the radiograph, this is pretty typical of a pseudo coarctation. Uh, this was an older patient. And we see, just like in your case, Travis, a fairly high aortic arch, and I'll make a sagittal, um, but really no significant stenosis there. And so by definition, it's, you know, if there is a gradient, it's, it's below 10 millimeters of mercury. Um, and um, it's more of a kink. And it's kinks because of the anchor point between the aorta and the and the pulmonary through the ligament. So it's a high riding arch. And then you'll see the, the vessels come off way up here. So I'll make a sagittal like this. Blow it up on the chest portion. We can 
can see the oops. so we can follow the aorta up and there's that sort of kink there but it's not a real narrow and then there's sort of that anchor point there from the ligament if we thicken this up on a MIP and bring it out a little bit and this one did not have a bicuspid valve this one has a normal aortic valve so sort of an incidental finding and this patient I believe was in their 60s or something so completely uh, unrelated to their cough but I take it you would agree this is another pseudocoarctation, David. Absolutely. Yeah, it's funny because I hadn't seen one in a long time. I was kind of I made the comment I think I hadn't seen one in a while. Well, I'm sorry I lost my uh, my uh, cervical aortic arch images. I just seem to have the um, the flow images, um, not the uh, anatomic ones. But yeah, it was just like Travis's case. Very nice. Have any, do any of you guys do, um, I know we're all adult radiologists, but do any of you do these sort of uh, cine airway studies with some of the newer, like 100 bow plus scanners that have longer Z axis coverage? We don't have anything. No. That okay. I like. Yeah, the, the issue of, uh, tracheobronchiomalacia, at least in our place, doesn't seem to come up very often. Well, I should say, it seems to come up only once every couple of years, or we ask to image a patient for possible an adult tracheobronchiomalacia. Yeah, we, we do our airway protocol a handful of times a year in the adult world, but you know, we, we have a sort of a growing congenital heart practice for the, the children. So that's, I think we'll mostly be doing them there, but I wonder with some of our dynamic airways, because you get, we're not, we don't get to see the full functional portion of it. If I don't know how much more additional information it, it gives, um, because if you get a good expiratory image, you, you, you get a sense of where things are narrowed. And even on the inspiratory images, you can usually find if there's tracheomalacia, you'll see the abnormal cartilage. But I do have cases of excessive dynamic airway collapse where the cartilage is intact and it looks perfectly normal on inspiration. But that posterior membrane becomes very redundant and floppy, um, or at least if, um, on expiration, you can see how mobile it is. So I wonder um, if we if we ever try this in an adult, if we would get um, kind of get a sense of what that airway is doing. I don't know if it changes management, but I, um, at least in the pediatric side, they were pretty excited about it. All right. Um, yeah, well, and it's better than doing the static and expiratory stuff too, physiologically. Right. Because yeah, so, we do our tracheomalacias yeah. and airway collapses as a as a forced expiration. But even then, you're it's you know timing it right and coaching the patient is very challenging. Versus if you actually you know can have them breathing in and out um, and watch it, maybe interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, let me see if I have anything else I could show. Well, I could show that diaphragm case um, since we still have time. Um, sure. Let me load it up. All right. Yeah. So this is a 38-year-old woman um, who was referred to our thoracic, one of our thoracic surgeons for um, her diaphragm. Story is she developed acute onset chest pain um, several weeks ago after a flu-like illness. Unclear what that was, but some respiratory illness, coughing and stuff. And the on, on asking her questions, um, let me show, let me start with the image here. You can see um, on this coronal, we've got this really peaked diaphragm. You can see there is muscle intact out laterally, there's stomach, and then you sort of lose the muscle here as we go more posteriorly. And I'll show it on the sagittal, same kind of story. You see a nice thick diaphragm anteriorly, but then you sort of lose it. Um, we see stomach uh, and, and um, uh, spleen up in here all the way up against the chest wall and on the axial a nice a really nice example of the dependent viscera sign you should never really see spleen I mean there's just no visible diaphragm back here spleen up against here so the story goes back about it was about eight or ten years ago she and her husband were in a motor vehicle crash and he said oh it wasn't a major one and then she pointed out it was actually a rollover but they they were never seen in a hospital it sounds like or never fully evaluated it didn't sound like there was much so i was looking because when i see this i was looking that was my question so was there any little trauma because i didn't see any any fractured ribs or anything 
that suggested there had been trauma. I didn't see any, the spleen was there. I didn't see any splenosis and you know, all the things we think about. So, cause his question to me is, was this congenital or not? But I think it's important to recognize, and David's pointed this out a lot, that the cruce is really thick here. And he's got a nice robust diaphragm. So to me, this doesn't look like a paralyzed diaphragm. It doesn't look like a, a weakened diaphragm and even tration. Um, and then eventually as you scroll, you can see where it's missing. Um, and, it, and it has a normal contour until you get up to where the, um, where the, the sort of takes that really steep uh, increase right there. So it's not like a, a, a broad-based dome. So presumably, here's my theory, and I don't know if it's true, and I'll never prove it, but yeah. yes, yes. Well, you've got, well, you've got, well, you've got the sagittal here. Look at the discontinuity here. You could start out with nice thick muscle anteriorly, yeah. and it just ends. Right. So right. I think there's, a, you know, that's the edge of the of the muscle defect there. And there's just a little bit, and there's a like a little bit hanging out. There's not much posteriorly there, but there, I think there's a little bit. Um, Somewhere, as you get more central, there was a little bit of diaphragm left. Yeah, so the surgeon's question is, you know, what, how is he going to approach this to repair it? Because you need something to sew to if they're going to do a patch. And if there's no muscle posteriorly, it's a different approach. Um, but my theory with, with, with this patient is that she probably had a partial thickness tear eight years ago or whenever her motor vehicle crash was. For some reason, managed not to fracture any ribs or, or spleen. Or maybe she had a small splenic injury that healed. Um, and then perhaps during this recent um, event, um, it became a full thickness tear, which would explain why the cruise is still pretty healthy looking, uh, that it didn't atrophy from sort of disuse. Um, and that maybe that it just completed the rupture. And that's why she had the acute onset pain. And this had never been an issue before. Um, that would be my theory. Alternatively, they're true, true and unrelated. And this thing's been there. But I, I like the theory of the delayed rupture just because how thick that cruise is on the current exam. So, uh, Jeff, you said her accident was eight years before? Eight or ten years ago, yes. Right. Yeah. Never, never was imaged at that time. There's, they didn't take a chest X-ray. They didn't CT her. I don't. We don't know the story, but she and her husband said, "Yeah, they never really got any any care." Sounds like they weren't that injured, but clearly she was. Jeff, I got the aorta case here that I wanted to Excellent. wanted to discuss. Okay. All right, let me, there we go. So you sent this case long ago, and um, um, it shows this abnormal right mediastinum here with an impression on the trachea above the level of what looks like a left aortic arch. And um, here's the CT scan on this case. So we have this very nice symmetry of the brachycephalic arteries here in the upper mediastinum and in the neck. And then we have this right aortic arch here, very nice right aortic arch with trying to form an, ab an aberrant left subclavian, which it succeeds in doing, I think. And then we have this other vessel anteriorly here, which is coming off horizontally. And, um, you know, you, this was this was labeled back in the time, and this case is from, I think, 20, 2007 which you sent, I think, in 2011. So it looked like a right aortic arch with aberrant subclavian. But the horizontal position of this anterior moiety, I just always relish the opportunities to use the word moiety, you know, is more horizontal than you'd expect with, um, you know, a brachycephalic artery um, anteriorly there. And uh, let's look at a um, coronal, because I think this case really illustrates the point that you were making earlier today, which is the horizontal uh, origin of this left moiety. So here it is coming off here. So I think this is really distinctive for double aortic arch because in the situation of double aortic arch, you have a larger right arch and it goes higher than the left. So this is the level of the normal left uh, arch. And so the reason it, it comes off horizontally is because it's coming off the side because the ascending aorta for in a right arch is going to go higher than normal. So in double arch, the aorta, the right aortic arch is high, and it's much higher than the left. So that means that the left has to be has to come off the side. And so this is really beautifully coming off the side. And then, as you saw in cross sections, we have that symmetry of the vessels uh, in the upper mediastinum and neck. And so this this finding, I think, 
we would both agree these findings really go with double aortic arch with a tretic segment rather than right aortic arch and aberrant subclavian. Yes, agree? and I do. And I wonder if a lot of those old classified type two right aortic arches where it has the diverticulum really right. are double arches. Yeah. So um, I think this is a spe spectacular case for illustrating what we've what we've learned in the last few years. I mean, the, our discussions in this conference, you know, and our discussions of aorta have really been very helpful to me. So again, the horizontal course of this left moiety here, and um, and which portion is atritic? David, show us the actual atritic portion. So or this, segment, then. this this anterior moiety here is going to give rise to the carotid and um, and um, okay, so it's doing carotid here, and then we've got. Um, let me. Here's the subclavian coming off here, which is kind of small. Okay, it looks as if it's uh, it kind of has a pinched origin here. So that's the subclavian. It's going to continue up, I think. So that's a little strange there. And there's a, there's a left. By the way, there's a left um, ligamentum here. So this person has does have a ring. Okay, so I think that I think that is the subclavian coming off there. I don't. This is actually the subclavian here. So let's 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 do the subclavian again. The subclavian comes off the anterior moiety. Okay, so our interruption is post subclavian. Okay, so this is the interrupted segment here that has the the what this bright calcium here. I don't think that's a clip. I think it's calcium. That makes sense. Yeah, As the atretic segment is post subclavian, and then okay. just, just posterior to the little calcification is that a nubbin of something? Yes, it looks like a nubbin of contrast, but it doesn't seem to go anywhere. Doesn't so, seem yeah, I don't, I don't think that's the, you know, I don't think that's the ductus. Although I could be wrong about that. Okay, well, um, there's some mysteries here, and I, you know, this is so bright, I wonder if it really is a surgical clip. I should go back and look at the chest radiograph. Sorry, yes, there has been surgery here. We do have some clips. You wonder if they ligated the ductus arteriosus or something. Yeah, so uh, I guess, I guess uh, Howard, the explanation for that little uh, contrast bump is it's something that may be post-surgical. You know, that's post surgical. They ligated something there, remnant of the li ligament of the of a of a ductus arteriosus. I think that's that's probably a good idea. And you can see the effect, the deformity here of the airway. You can see why this person does have symptoms of ring. Okay, so uh, once again, I think the corona in this case is spectacular for explaining the. Uh, the sideway, the off the side origin of the left moiety here. And uh, I think this is this case really illustrates that beautifully. So a horizontal course coming off the side and a high right uh, aortic arch really go with double aortic arch. Because with an ordinary right aortic arch, it doesn't tend to be as high as it is with double arch. Cool. 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 All right. I well, love our guys. guys. I learned so much. Me too. Well, we had a lot. Can of I show work. something really quick? Sure, of course. We have got two minutes. Crowd them in. This is courtesy of Sebastian McWilliams, who was a Mallinckrodt resident and is now a, in Boston doing his fellowship. And he sent this back to Sanjeev and others. Uh, this was a patient that got referred to them. This was the neck CT. And on the next CT, they were a little worried about a dissection here. They saw this stuff in the aorta and hopefully everybody watching this that's seen similar cases to this instantly notices a few things You know, here. It's very ill-defined, wispy. We've also got a pretty narrow window and then they, he only sent me these, these JPEGs, but you can see on the sagittal reconstruction again, it's a very ill-defined, smoky looking filling defect. And I think we're, reaching the leading edge of the contrast column in the descending aorta too. Granted, it's out of plane, but it's certainly portions of the aorta are less opacified than the ascending aorta. So they repeated a CTA at the outside and the thing persisted, but it looks different. You'll see that it's here, it's a little bit broader here, it was there. So this just confused them even more. 
as you can see, this is another image from that. So this was done the next day or something. And then I guess they did a third study as well. They gated one study and still had it there. And of course, you know, they were trying to figure out because they all thought it was a flow artifact, but didn't know what to do and, and you know, weren't sure why it was still showing up. And I think it's because every time they just did a, 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 a arterial phase study, then he sent these images that they finally did a delay. And now you can see that it went away. So it is in fact just smoke in the aorta. Some of the window level was a little harsh, as you can see here, which brings it out as Howard's shown before. And also this patient had a little bit of LV failure. Their ejection fraction was between 30 and 35%, which also precipitates you know, this when you have slow flow and you're at the leading edge of the contrast. So another good example. Travis, on your, on your sagittal view, you, yeah. can, you can see how the hydrodynamics force the uh, flow around the outer edge, the greater curve. Right. It leaves this relative vacuum uh, immediately like that. So there's going to be a lot of turbulence and swirling there on the on the inner curve, the, the, the lesser curve. Right. This is the sediment deposit like you referred to with the uh, river flow. The sediment deposit is where you have the, the low attenuation and the, the, right. the this flow is directed against the edge. And that's why that's why rivers get snaky because they keep eroding that outer edge and depositing on the inner edge. That increases the curvature and the tortuosity of rivers. They meander because of that. So yeah, this was one that you know I I had no doubt that this was just flow artifact being shown multiple times because we've shown so many cases of this. But good thing they did it delayed rather than trying to you know intervene on this patient in some way. Oh, that's dramatic. All right, guys. Well, thank you, and we'll talk again. Um, I don't know. Uh, rank and raise next week, but I'll be around, and so I, we'll plan on meeting unless we don't. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll be in D.C. on Thursday, so I'll catch you guys the week after. Okay, have a good time. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank Bye. you. Bye.